Hi, I'm Angus Cress Gillespie, your host for East Brunswick Television. I'm here with Professor Colin Williamson of Rutgers University. He's the author of the new book, Hidden in Plain Sight, published by Rutgers University Press. This book maps the overlooked history of special effects in the movies, and I'm pleased that Professor Williamson is able to join us in our studio today. Colin, I understand you've recently taken a job with the American Studies Department at, at Rutgers. Can you tell me a little bit about that job? So that job is, I'd say, technically a joint appointment between American Studies and the Cinema Studies program at Rutgers. Um, and I would say, I guess, in our department, it's I'm the resident American film historian. Uh -huh. um, so currently teaching uh, American film history classes. Uh, last year or last semester to, to undergraduate students. This semester, I'm working with some graduate students. And in some of it's in cinema studies, and some of it's in American studies. Yeah. So both semesters, I've been te teaching classes that are pretty seamless across both disciplines. Yeah. yeah. And and how did you happen to choose this profession? Oh, geez. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I thought I wanted to go into the movies. Uh, so after college, I went into the movies and decided I missed reading and writing. Uh, and the option I thought I had was to go to graduate school. So I went to graduate school. And if you go to graduate school, one of the only options you have is to be you know, a teacher. <laughs> uh, so it was partly by happenstance. But uh, in the education process, I learned that I loved you know, interacting with people, producing knowledge. And part of that involved you know, interacting with students and uh, realized that that was probably the most rewarding part of, uh, say, film practice and film history for me. So, so in Hollywood, you were actually involved in the industry, uh, but, but that didn't quite fit, and so you switched to graduate school. To, yeah, so the switch was, I would say, quite natural. Um, but I did, you know, I wanted to be in production. Uh, and it's still very important to me. So when I teach uh, history classes now, I do a lot of history of production practices yeah. and trying to help students uh, who are interested in film production, who want to go into the industry, understand the value of studying history, for example. Ah, uh, OK. Yeah. So how does the current position fit in with your overall career goals? Ah, I think, especially at Rutgers, I've always wanted to be in a public university system. I was raised in public schools. and. Uh, I would say long-term research goals and teaching goals, it's uh, the place that will allow me, or the profession is the thing that will allow me to do you know, really interesting scholarship uh, yeah. that is ultimately informed by interactions with students. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we've touched on this, but what are your favorite classes to teach? Oh, gosh. I actually don't spread this too loudly, because everybody will make me teach this every semester. But I really like the intro, introductory classes, um, where I meet students for the first time who are really encountering this thing called film studies or film history, uh, and trying to bring them around to you know, understanding the value of it. Um, so getting fresh faces and the challenge of convincing them that it's worthwhile to do something you know, yeah. in film history. Yeah, I, I do the same thing. I usually try to teach one first year class every year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, tell us about the importance say, of, of Charlie Chaplin's Easy Street of 1917. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, so I actually grew up on Easy Street in California. Huh. Um, and one of the, the early films that uh, I remember watching when I first encountered, encountered silent films was uh, Charlie Chaplin's film Easy Street, which does not take place in California and does not take place on my street. Um, but I had this, this odd kind of connection to this, this weird reference in a title. Um, and then the story is just absurd. As far as Chaplin's slapstick comedy goes, he falls on a cocaine needle and, and goes ballistic in the town. And um, it's, it's hilarious and you know, really short and concise. And it's just, I would say, one of the more fun movies, the silent period, that I enjoy. Yeah. And because it's silent, he uses all these over-exaggerated gestures. Yes, yeah. he's very hyperbolic and physical. So the physical comedy lends itself very well to the silent uh, film mode. Yeah. Shifting gears, tell us a little bit about the special effects used in the Hollywood 
horror movies of the 1930s. Oh, yeah, so uh, I did a little bit of work on early horror films and early sound horror films. So the early 1930s are quite important, transitioning in Hollywood over to synchronized sound. Um, and this film that I worked on by uh, a filmmaker, Michael Curtiz. Michael Curtiz is known uh, not necessarily for making horror films. Uh, he's known for Casablanca, is uh, the film that he's known for. And he made this really offbeat horror film using uh, wax museum artifacts. Ah. So special effects through wax figurines and, and things like that. Um, really practical special effects. So nothing fancy, but really kind of dirty and gritty and uh, handmade and uh, awful. Just really, really awful, but it fits with the early horror film. That's so, cool, yeah. 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 Uh, jumping way ahead, um, what can we learn from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that, <laughs> 1977? Yeah, I would say we can learn a lot and very little about it. Um, it's one of these odd sci-fi films that people really despise. Um, it's not a great story. The special effects are quite extraordinary. So one of the things that was important about it and that's important to the work that I do is that it really pioneered some innovative, uh, almost computerized special effects in the 1970s. Which is pretty um, early. Very early, yes. And Star Wars is the, the you know, claim to fame on pioneering a lot of that stuff. But Close Encounters yeah. of the Third Kind was really experimenting, especially if you, if you go back and watch it with these spaceships that light up you know, pretty, pretty lights. Yeah. Um, and it was mostly intended to be psychedelic. So the special ah. effects were intended to appeal to a 1970s kind of counterculture generation, uh, m you know, might have been, you know, using psychedelic drugs and then observing the special effects in the, in the movie and having a really different experience than people who are not. Very timely. Very timely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, moving ahead, what can we learn from Blade Runner of 1982? Ah, Blade Runner. That, in terms of science fiction and special effects, I would say is very prescient. So it's been making a comeback recently with the, the remakes and sequels. Um, that film is quite important, I would say, in the 1980s for anticipating what, say, computerized and automated technologies would do to humanity. Um, and it's this really interesting moment in the history of science fiction in the United States in, in sci-fi filmmaking where it really hit the nail on the head uh. of saying, like, humanity will change fundamentally with these technologies that are on the horizon in the, the late 80s into the 90s, um, which is why you're seeing it kind of recur throughout the, the rest of the 20th century. So yeah. we, we haven't forgotten that. Uh, haven't forgotten it, nor have we, you know, unlearned, you know, the dangers of computers, I would say, yeah. And an another topic, what's the significance of the animated films of Tim Burton? Ah, uh, Tim Burton is quite extraordinary, I would say, uh, as something like a forgotten icon in Hollywood. Everybody, especially when I talk to students, they really know Tim Burton. They're familiar with Nightmare Before Christmas, his famous uh, clay animation film, um, but seems consistently left out of histories of film and scholarship on film. Uh, but in, I would say, the 1980s and 1990s was incredibly valuable for bringing back kind of material animation. So working with Clay at a time when people were turning to computers to animate. Uh, he wanted to work with puppets and objects and uh, these childhood things that really mattered to, to audiences. So, sort of old-fashioned. Very old-fashioned, uh, yeah. And you're teaching at, at an American university. Is there any point in having your students study films of the French New Wave? Oh, very much so. Yeah, so I teach, mostly I'll teach within the, the American historical context, but the way that I do it is broadly through a global perspective. And one of the angles I typically take is to demonstrate to students how Hollywood likes to appropriate and co-opt things like uh. taking French New Wave styles and transforming them into uh, new American Hollywood in the 60s and 70s. So if you've seen Taxi Driver by Martin Scorsese, that's drawing on the French New Wave you know, experiments in the 60s. Um, so I'd say incredibly important to what students can know about American history in particular, too. And you're speaking about expropriation, are the Chinese expropriating American f techniques? There is a really strong synergy, at least in the in industry. So within the film industry in the United States, there are global film productions that are really important to, to doing that. I would say the United States would be the, the the figure in the game that is actually kind of drawing on, say, Chinese filmmaking traditions or Hong Kong filmmaking traditions and trying to bring them more to American audiences. And, and India is a player now. 
Uh, Very much so, and I would say have been for quite a long time. Um, their film industry, and this is one of the, the challenges, especially in the context of teaching students, is to say that uh, Hollywood was not the only kind of beacon of filmmaking, that even in the 1920s it was really prominent, powerful in other uh, national contexts, and India was one of the earliest and biggest and yeah. long-standing ones. Yeah. Uh, so backing up, please tell me a little bit about your graduate work at the University of Chicago. Yeah, it was cold, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> No, it was a really transformative experience. I went there from working in the industry. I went straight to, to a PhD program at the University of Chicago. Um, and I wanted to do film history. So I specialized in graduate school uh, in early film history in particular, which for historians is not so early, but uh, around 1890 to the through the 1920s um, in the American context. And I spent most of my graduate work on that field. Yeah looking specifically at animated films, um, but I look at everything. Uh, you know, I have this, you know, I would say, challenge in my work of wanting to connect my like, early film interest to everything else, so uh, that was a struggle. But in graduate school, that was my primary focus, American animation uh, in the early period. And maybe a tough question, but what do you see as the major challenges of your new position at Rutgers? Uh, I would say holding on to that early film historian's kind of roots in the context of cinema studies in particular being very driven into the digital age. And so that even students coming in wanting to learn about film, film and, uh, filmmaking and film studies from a critical perspective, um, less and less see the value of looking at uh. this early stuff. Um, and it's an exciting challenge for me to say it matters, not just because it's a cultural product, but also because it helps us understand the new, right? So the digital yeah. stuff that we inhabit, we can understand better if we understood the, the earlier forms. And, and a related question, uh, why should Rutgers students study film at all? Ah, very good. Mm -hmm. I would say film as a medium and say film studies or cinema studies as a discipline has its hands in everything. And so it's very easy for me as a, a film historian to sit in an American studies department and teach in cinema studies because it has this quite natural interdisciplinarity, right? Uh, so films or students who come to, to study film, say at Rutgers, have a really wonderful opportunity to use this medium to connect to everything. Um, and I regularly get like biology students who come and take my film classes, even in the, the most recent semesters, just because it fulfills an arts requirement, right? and then in the process get transformed into a deeper understanding of you know, yeah. the relevance of moving images to biological science. And so as a follow-up to that, it's worthwhile even for somebody who's majoring in accounting or chemistry. Oh, very much so. uh, yeah, and if we think broadly about film culture, right, almost every job is gonna involve yeah. the moving image now. Yeah. Social media down to film production, Hollywood. Yeah. And a broad question, how does the study of film help us understand what is American about America? Ah, I can answer that by uh, giving you a little background on this new course I'm teaching right now on American animation. Um, and I just had my first meeting with students yesterday and uh, pitched that question of what makes American animation, anima uh, uh, what makes American animation American? Right? And one of the things that comes out of that question is, well, the United States, I say, as a nation, cares about dreams and opportunity and freedom and all these kind of nationalistic themes. And in animation, animators are actually experimenting with that. So animated films lend themselves to manifesting dreams. And they, like, formally, cartoons have this freedom and flexibility that allows them to tap into kind of national identity. Um, and that's one of the ways that I frame the kind of national context for, for film history is to root it in the fact that films are kind of manifestations of deeper, you know, uh, national concerns. It, so, oh, I, I, I wanted to follow up with that. Do they ever focus on how hard work leads to success? That, that, uh, yeah, and that, that, that American dream ethos and the, I'd say, deep national optimism gets yeah. like manu manufactured, I would say, by Hollywood in particular. That's yeah. what it built itself on, the dream factory, right? Yeah, um, okay, that's good. Yeah. yeah, and that it becomes the place where whatever people think in the current moment it means to be an American uh -huh. or in the United States gets articulated very clearly through the, the film cultures at the time. And a broad question, how does cinema associated with magic? 
<laughs> yeah, so part of my graduate work uh, started with this early question of why were some of the earliest films produced by magicians? So they're, at its origins, film as a medium came from two places. It came from scientists who were experimenting with motion picture technologies to study you know, scientific phenomena, and magicians at the same time were using it to like, perform magic tricks. Um, and I really wondered why magic, right? So why at the very beginning were there magicians playing with moving images, um, and it has to do in terms of like you know long histories with the fact that film works like magic it's an optical trick it's an illusion and illusionism is really deeply embedded in the medium um, so it has a very kind of original relationship with magicians um, that I would say still persists for us we speak of like the magic of the movies that's actually quite literal they work like magic tricks yeah. on us yeah I remember reading in the early days of movies just the fact that the image moved at all was kind of a source of wonder. And, and I remember reading, like, in the early movies, there might be a, a picture of an oncoming train, and people in the audience would actually physically duck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so the, the wondrousness of movement was key to defining film as magic early on. The audiences were s simply astonished by the fact that the still photographs that they were used to in the 19th century could once again, like, in uh, the current moment in the 1890s, move. Um, so that novelty was the, the thing that allowed for them to think of it magically. Yeah. Yeah. And a follow-up to that is, why is it that magicians guard their secrets so closely? I would say it's part of a game that they play. Um, and in the first book project that I, I did, I did a lot of research into magic practices stretching back to the Enlightenment, so around 1650s through the 1700s. Um, and magicians stage this intellectual game with audiences of you have to discover the secrets behind the tricks that you're observing, um, but you will never actually get access to that. So there's this kind of power dynamic of if the magician protects the secrets, the audience wants to know them more, they keep coming back, they try to figure out the tricks. <laughs> um, and we can extend that to capitalism, right, in the way that, you know, uh, people buying products are, are kind of mystified by objects, and that's part of the history of magic. But broadly, it is about, um, this dynamic relationship with audiences of concealing the truth so that audiences want to know more. Um, and that was, I would say, very specifically a tradition of magic going back to the 1600s. Yeah, when, when I was in college, my roommate was an amateur magician. Um, he built himself as the world's 37th greatest magician. That's very humble. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and um, in my association with him, I learned not to ask how it's done. I mean, he, he wouldn't tell me, yeah. so I just became comfortable with that. I said, okay, I'll just allow myself to be amazed. Uh, and to I, sit I, with I, the wonder, yeah. yeah, yeah. I won't bother to probe, because I'm not gonna <laughs> get anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is a trick film? So early trick films, they were, now what we would call a genre, so horror films are genres, detective films are genres. Early trick films um, were films that use special effects, usually performed by magicians. So you would have a magician on the screen performing stage magic tricks, uh, and those stage magic tricks you know, the, would look like they would look in a theater, but they would be performed in the film through special effects. So if a magician made something disappear, it was through editing. Um, wow. and it was part of the early novelty of film that audiences were interested in exploring the possibilities of what films could do magically, um, so that it proliferated early on to the point where it became generic. Uh, enough films resembled each other to be called the trick film. So the magicians were actually using film as an arrow in their quiver uh, as an additional way to trick people. Correct, yeah, so film as an extension of established magic yeah. practices, just another yeah. trick, yeah. yeah. And what is sleight of hand? That is, uh, you know, in, in the history of magic, a form of misdirection, right? So if I do this and I do something over here. Um, you distract me. Distraction, right? yeah, uh, to control the audience's focus. And if you manipulate their attention, you can, you know, trick them through uh, other manipulations. Right? Yeah. A follow-up, can you tell us a little bit about Ingmar Bergman's The Magician, uh, made in 1958? Yeah, it's an extraordinary film. So it's a talk about avant-garde, you know, European avant-garde filmmakers. Uh, 
Bergman took up the subject of magic by making a film about a magician. Uh, and the whole film revolves around this, this question of whether or not the magician's tricks are real, if he's performing real magic, so if it's supernatural or if it's easily explained. Um, so there's this kind of detective narrative and a mystery narrative organized around a magician who gets basically held up in a house and people are trying to figure out how he does his tricks. Um, and it has to do with you know, bringing the dead back to life and uh, ultimately the film ends ambiguously. People don't know whether it was supernatural or simply sleight of hand. Um, really important as far as you know, filmmaking goes to raise the question of what if, right? You know, if we're dealing with magic, is it rationally explicable or does it inhabit some other realm that you know, uh, is beyond science and beyond language and beyond reason? Um, it's also just a very odd and quite absurd film. Yeah. Worth, worth Were there any out. films where people would conduct seances and try to communicate with the dead? Yeah, so I can't think of specific titles right now. Harry Houdini was involved with some of those uh, yeah. very early on uh, in the, the teens and the 20s. And that part of film's relationship with magic and spirituality is an extension of 19th century spirit photography practices. So especially in the United States after the Civil War, there's this movement. Uh, photographers were capturing the ghosts of the dead. Uh, through special effects to print uh, kind of apparitions in their photographs. And that kind of spirit photography movement got taken up by the cinema um, in the, the kind of the role of ghosts in, in early horror films and it is an extension of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also thinking about, what was it, 1917, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle was interested in the, the Cottingley Fairies. Yeah, yeah, and, and Conan Doyle is really helpful for that, that kind of balance between science and the occult, right, that gets taken up in uh, especially American detective films um, in the early 20th century. Um, so very prominent, I would say, in relation to the cinema. Yeah. Yeah. And what is the relationship between, say, time-lapse photography and, and, and magic? Yeah, so I... So time-lapse photography is, is fairly common in science filmmaking, right? So especially in popular science films, filmmakers will use time-lapse photography to reveal plant movements or s like the evolution of cells. And it's typically talked about in that scientific and educational context. Um, but if, as a popular audience, you look at a time-lapse film, it's actually quite wonderful and astonishing to see these like mysterious movements revealed through a, basically a, a trick of photography. Um, and I've done a lot of research on this and found that historically, time-lapse photography of plants is actually rooted in older magic tricks about plants, huh. uh, where magicians would make plants grow on stage in kind of a time-lapse fashion. Huh. Um, so that scientific use of the technology actually has kind of magical roots huh. that uh, I would say still means a lot to us when we are struck by the, the wondrousness of it. Yeah. And, and can you tell us a little bit about the mango tree trick? Yeah, so that was... Uh, <coughs> A trick in, I would say specifically in India um, from the 1700s into the 1800s, uh, it was performed uh, by Indian fakers, uh, so a kind, of, uh, a kind of magician, but not in the, the Western and especially not in the American context, would make a, a mango tree grow from uh, a seed and they would do it by you know, moving a sheet over the plant and by sleight of hand making it get bigger and bigger each time. Uh, to give the illusion of growth in the same way that a science film would reveal a plant huh. growing. Yeah. The idea though was that, uh, especially in that cultural context, that there were actually spirits that were animating the tree, so it was much more on uh, the religious and spiritual side than on the scientific. Yeah. yeah. And uh, tell us about the blow book trick. Uh, <laughs> that was another one, so uh, I happened upon this because I was doing research on early trick films, and a lot of early trick films in France featured this magic prop called a blow book, um, which works like a flip book. So if you're familiar with like 19th century flip books or stuff you made in, in school, you know, growing up with stick figures that move when you flip the pages, it worked like that, but it didn't produce the illusion of movement. It worked according to this kind of substitution technique where the magician would show you like flip through pages and all the pages would be blank in the book. And then the magician would breathe on it, hence blow book. Um, yeah and then flip it again and it would have images of something. Uh, and it worked by manipulating sets of tabs so that like one set of tabs was blank pages, one set of tabs was money or something like that. Um, and the idea was that the, the magician could give the audience the sense that they were breathing life into this book. Um, 
it is quite interesting in, in early trick films, they actually have these giant blow book like props that they pull people out of. So the, uh -huh. like the magician, George Melies is famous for doing this, would open the blow book and somebody would jump out of it. And uh, it was this kind of like fun interpretation of these older, you know, uh, let's say occult magic practices. Uh, yeah. uh, so the pictures come to life. Or yes. That's, that's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, now, talking more contemporary, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this uh, computer-generated imagery, or CGI? I would say one extraordinary advantage is that computer-generated images can do about anything. You can manufacture anything with the computer, right? And you can make anything look real. And that's part of the, the you know, the potential and the wondrousness of it that it has extraordinary like capabilities. Um, one of the I'd say pitfalls or you know possible detriments of that um, is that computer-generated imagery kind of insinuates itself into everything. And one thing that has happened, especially in American film history for the last few decades, is you start to see less and less of what's called practical stuff. So movie sets are disappearing, even human actors are disappearing because they can be replaced by kind of virtual uh, CGI ones. Um, and from a kind of an historian's perspective, but also a personal perspective, you lose this materiality. So I love, I study early film history because it has this, this quality to it. You could see the frames flicker and you could see the celluloid, you know, cracking. Um, and with CGI, you lose a lot of that kind of embeddedness yeah. in stuff. Um, philosophically, it's you know problematic for people, but there's something nostalgic about just having the material. Yeah. I'm think, you know, in some of the films of the 30s and 40s, it shows like two people in a car, and then in the background, the scenery is going by. How do they do that? Uh, so that's a rear projection process. So they would uh, have two people sitting in a car on a studio set, uh, and the studio like set wasn't you know uh, moving. The car wasn't actually moving, and they would project a film behind uh, a, a screen behind the the car window, and you would see the kind of movement that, down that's, the street. That's rear screen projection. Yeah, okay. and it's part of it is in terms of that materiality. You can feel it, right? And you're like, yeah. oh, that's obviously a trick, and uh, you yeah. kind of buy into it as this kind of magical quality. Yeah. Hollywood film, yeah. Uh, going way back, what was the appeal of those early Houdini films? So part of it stemmed from Houdini's celebrity as a magician doing performances, you know, especially in the United States, public performances of magic tricks, and then he started to adopt film as uh, a test, so people would start recording his magic stunts in public um, in order to, to figure out, you know, whether he did them truthfully or, you know, if he was, like, uh, deceiving people. Um, and then he fell through that uh, connection into filmmaking and people started to enjoy, you know, watching him perform within stories about magic and, yeah. and detection and whatnot. Yeah. So, Colin, you, you've written about all this. Uh, what was your first book? What was the title? So the first book was titled Hidden in Plain Sight. Uh, Hidden in Plain Sight. Yeah. And, and, and where can our viewers pick up a copy of that? So it's published by Rutgers University Press, so okay. I'm in a good place for it. Uh, available still through the press and through all the, the normal outlets, yeah. So hopefully it'll be available at the Rutgers Bookstore in the Bronx. Hopefully, I don't, I don't think I'm that prestigious, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> yeah. And tell us just a little bit about your new book project, Cinematic Wonderland. So the new book is kind of a follow-up to the first one. The first one was on magic and science and, and special effects. This one is on American animation in particular, um, in American animation's relationship with nature and science more broadly, which isn't what gets talked about normally. If we think about Disney, for example, we think fantasy and magic. Um, and the book will explore things like uh, Disney's relationship with active scientists, for example, in the 1940s, working with anatomists and physicists to design Bambi, the character, uh, in really interesting ways. Um, so that's the, the broad scope of it, of shifting the lens over to this kind of scientific history of animation. Yeah. Well, Colin, it was a real pleasure finding out about all this stuff. Uh, we'll have to get you back when the new book comes out. Oh, gosh, yeah, so in 12 years, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, thank you for having me. Okay.